الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So last week uh, we are, we're doing the family of Zayd ibn Haritha and we're going to continue insha'Allah ta'ala uh, to do the rest of the family members uh, We mentioned Zayd uh, as being uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, of course, he had been adopted by the Prophet. ﷺ. We had talked about the Arabic term for adoption. What is the Arabic term for adoption that was made haram? Who can remind me? Tabanni, Tabanni, to consider somebody an ibn, Tabanni. And we said that that is what is made haram by the Sharia, not raising a child um, or taking care of a child. These are things that are um, encouraged. And we had finished the life of Zayd, uh, and we now move on to. Uh, the wife of Zayd and the child of Zayd who are also famous. Uh, Zayd radiallahu ta'ala an, we know that he married um, at least three if not five uh, wives throughout the course of his life. Uh, but his first wife and the one that is the most prominent in the seerah is none other than Ummi Ayman. None other than Ummi Ayman. Who is Ummi Ayman? Ummi Ayman was a slave who actually belonged to Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she was from some land in Africa. We do not know uh, which land. They did not have the, the countries that we do now. And they were simply called uh, yani Habashi at that time. Didn't just mean from Ethiopia. It simply meant from that region. However, most of the slaves in that time frame in Arabia were from what we call Abyssinia or Habasha. So they were called Habashi. So most likely she was from that region, but we do not know for sure. And Umm Ayman, her name was Baraka. Her name was Baraka. Umm Ayman is the kunya that she has. And Umm Ayman was one of the very, very few items that belonged to Abdullah the father of the Prophet ﷺ. And that when Abdullah died, the Prophet ﷺ inherited from uh, his father, Abdullah. Uh, what else did his father leave? His father did not even have a house that he left. He was most likely living with Abdul Muttalib. Uh, it is said that he left only some animals, some camels and some sheep. And he left Ummi Ayman. Uh, and these were then inherited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now obviously when Abdullah died, Amina is still alive. And so Amina uh, takes charge of Ummi Ayman. And she was the one who uh, when Amina passed away uh, in the place called, who remembers where Amina died? Where did Amina die? This is a quiz going back seven years. Yeah, where? Where? No, there is no Kufa at this time. Kufa is in the time of Umar al-Khattab. There is no Kufa at this time. No, no. No, coming back from Medina. Coming back from, well, at the time it was Yathrib, there was no Medina. It's called al Abwa. And to this day, there is a qabr uh, of Amina. In fact, if you go onto YouTube and you type the grave of Amina, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ, somebody has actually done a video uh, on the cell phone. Somebody has visited that. I have not personally been to that place. Uh, and it is still known to this day. It is outside a small village and you find the qabr of Amina, uh, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ. And we know from the seerah that he visited this place. Right? We know this. He visited this particular place. Now, uh, Amina was returning from Yathrib, and as we know, she fell sick. And therefore, literally in the middle of the desert, just two stops away from Mecca, the Prophet was left a full orphan. Who brought him back? It was Umm Ayman. It was Umm Ayman who then brought him back from Abwa to uh, Mecca. And of course, then Abdul Muttalib took charge of the Prophet. So, Umm Ayman then became a second mother figure. Now let's be very clear. She was not a foster mother, i.e. she did not give of her milk to the Prophet Okay? That we have a number of people, Thuwayba and Halima and others. Umm Ayman was not one of those foster mothers. However, she was a mother figure. She was a mother figure to the Prophet wasallam, And of course, technically she is a slave. Technically, she has been inherited by the Prophet wasallam, but we know how the Prophet dealt and treated his slaves. None of them felt like slaves. And in fact, uh, 
from what we know, he freed her when he became of age. When he became a young man, he freed Ummi Ayman, and Ummi Ayman then stayed with him voluntarily. Ummi Ayman stayed with him voluntarily, not as a slave, but simply as a servant and in the family household. And uh, Ummi Ayman first married somebody uh, by the name of Ubaid ibn Zayd. Ubaid ibn Zayd. And from this marriage, Ayman was born. Hence her kunya, Ummi Ayman. Okay, so her first marriage is to somebody, we don't know much about him, pre-Islamic, this is nothing to do with, this is way before the coming of Islam. She married somebody by the name of Ubaid ibn Zayd, and from this, Ayman ibn Ubaid is born. And Ayman is of the companions who have a very, very minor role. So meaning Ayman embraced Islam. And Ayman participated in some of the battles, and we know that he was of those who... Uh, was with the group of the Prophet in the Battle of Hunayn. So remember in the Battle of Hunayn, uh, when the arrows began flying in, pretty much everybody fled because of the arrows, except for a small group immediately surrounding the Prophet probably less than two dozen people. And they have a special status. Those who stayed around the process in the Battle of Hunayn, they have a special status. So anytime it's one of those companions and you read a biography of them, it will be said, this is one of those who stayed behind. So one of those, around 15 or, around, or less than that, one of those who stayed behind is this Ayman, the son of Ummi Ayman. Okay? Now obviously there's no biological relation between Ayman and the, and the Prophet but it's sim- simply the son of of a mother figure to the Prophet However, as he stayed behind, he then became a shaheed in that battle. So he died in the battle of Hunayn as a result of trying to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This Ayman, that's mother Ummi Ayman, that's Baraka, uh, that's the one that we are talking about right now. So, at some point, uh, Ubaid ibn Zayd divorces uh, Ummi Ayman. We do not know when this occurred. And the Prophet ﷺ then said, and this is now the beginning of Islam now. So now this is in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ then said, Whoever wants to marry a lady from Jannah, let him marry Ummi Ayman. Okay? So he's encouraging the Sahaba. Whoever wants to marry a, Jann- a lady from Jannah, then let him marry Ummi Ayman. So, this is now the beginning of Islam. This is the Meccan phase. And the Prophet encourages any illegible bachelor who wants to marry a righteous and pious lady, then this person should marry Ummi Ayman. Now, Ummi Ayman, she was not an Arab, was she? And she had the stigma of being a Mawla. And a Mawla is somebody who used to be a slave and then has been, and then has been uh, set free. And we know that the Arabs at that time were also a racist society. And... The skin color is also a factor. So her nasab and her lineage and her looks, all of it are not in her favor. And that's why the Prophet is saying, whoever wants to marry a lady from Jannah, her character, her iman or ikhlaq are the best. Whoever wants to marry a lady from Jannah, let him choose Ummi Ayman. And this was when Zayd proposed for uh, Ummi Ayman's hand. So Zayd ibn Haritha, and obviously... We can assume that Zayd knows Ummi Ayman very well because they're in the same household. So when the Prophet made this announcement, then Zayd ibn Haritha then proposed. And it is possible, Allah knows best, it is possible that perhaps the Prophet was hinting at this to Zayd as well. And it's not something that is uh, strange or whatnot because they're in the household. And so he proposed to her hand and the Prophet ﷺ then married them in his house. So these are both freed servants of the Prophet ﷺ. Zayd is of course the, at this point in time, the son. Remember, at this point in time, he is the quote-unquote son, right? The Tabanni son. And Ummi Ayman is a figure that has been also in the household from the uh, beginning. And... Uh, When you look at the age gap between the two, there must have been a significant age gap. Because do the math, okay? Zayd entered the household of the Prophet when he was how old? This is last week's discussion, guys. No, when he entered? 13, maybe even younger than this, but basically a young boy. Yeah, 13. Not somebody said 20, no, no, not definitely not. Definitely not. 
maybe 11, 12, maybe 11, 12. So he's basically not yet baligh, but almost baligh, right? And how old was the Prophet ﷺ at this point in time? When did he get married? Remember, Zaid was a wedding gift, remember? 25, 25, right? So the age difference between the Prophet and, and Zaid is? 13, 12, 13, 14 years. Okay, everybody following? 12, 13 years. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, where is Umm Ayman in terms of age? At least 20 older than him? Where did you get 20? He inherited. Okay, so he was, he was, he was six years old when Ummi Ayman brings, <coughs> brings him back from Abwa. Now, Remember, don't back project our ages of maturity onto those people. You said 18 because there is the assumption that you must be at least 18 years old to drive a car or drive a camel or something. That's not in that time, is it? Right? In that time, in fact, not even that time, talk to your parents and my grandparents' age. People matured very quickly back then. They didn't have the luxury of being children till they were 18. Okay? And... At a young age, you could give many responsibilities to the children. So we don't know how old Umm Ayman was, but at the very, very least, Umm Ayman <coughs> would have to be realistically at least, at least nine, ten years old when she is bringing the process and back. If not more than this, and he cannot really even at that age, even ten is relatively young for such a ten-year-old, but still. It wasn't as if Umm Ayman intended to alone take the Prophet ﷺ. She was under Amina's guardianship. Amina passes away. Circumstances kind of push her to now take charge. And it's not, it, the road is there. It's like the highway. Remember, we think of it as the desert. And it is a desert. But even in the desert, there is a road. Just like now, there is a road. And there are people, and there are caravans, and there are stops, and there are water places. So people know and the route between Mecca and Medina is well-traveled. It's well-traveled. That's why the Hijrah was a very different route. That's why they had to hire a guide to go away from the road. So, <clears throat> the very least we can say is Umm Ayman is at least five years older than the Prophet if not ten years older. Okay? Now, what this means, therefore, is that when uh, Zayd is marrying Umm Ayman, there is a gap of at least 15 to 25 years between them. The very minimum. But Umm Ayman is still in her fertile years because after all, she has a child by the name of Usama. Okay? So, putting all of this together, realistically speaking, the max we can say, I mean biologically can be more, but realistically she'll be in her maybe early 40s when she has Usama. I mean, Technically, she can have a child even when she's 50 or late 40s, but still, realistically speaking, I'm just being, maybe Umm Ayman is in her early 40s, right? And Zaid is in his early 20s, okay? So there is a big age gap between Umm Ayman and between Zaid, but that is not an impediment at all. And again, this shows that things were very different back then in terms of uh, this issue of age and whatnot. It's not something that, like in our times, we have these big issues. Back then, even we know the age gap between our Prophet and Khadija, as we had mentioned, there's two opinions. But one opinion is that it was uh, 15 years. So from this blessed marriage, of course, the companion, the famous companion, the one who is given the title, Hibbu Rasulillah, that's his title, Hibbu Rasulillah. And Hib means Mahbub. Hib means the one who is beloved. So Hibbu Rasulillah, the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is um, born, and that is Usama ibn Zayd. And we'll get to Usama right now. Let's finish up Umm Ayman. Then we're moving on to Usama, inshaAllah ta'ala. Now, Umm Ayman, as is the case with all of the female Sahaba, we have very, very little information about her. When we get to the female Sahaba, when we get to the wives uh, uh, of the Prophet and our mothers, you will see just snippets here and there because 
that is the way. They would just not mention much information about women. So we only know a few things here and there. One of the things that we know, Ibn Sa'd reports, that Umm Ayman, on the way to Medina, on her way to, to performing the hijrah, while she was performing the hijrah, uh, that Umm Ayman ran out of water and she was fasting. So she's fasting on the journey to hijrah and she runs out of water and the situation becomes very dire. She comes close to fainting or death or whatnot. And Umm Ayman then narrates that I saw a bucket come from the samawat, from the heavens on a bright and shiny rope. And the bucket came right in front of me and I lifted the bucket and I drank to my fill from that bucket. And Umm Ayman said that from that point in time, up until now, I have never felt thirsty. Even if it is a hot day and I'm fasting, I'm not feeling thirsty after that. Okay, so this is one of the karamat, one of the uh, miracles that are given uh, to the righteous. So Umm Ayman was blessed with this uh, miracle. And Umm Ayman as well, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would regularly visit her. Uh, she had a special house, it is said, uh, between Mecca, between Medina and, and um, uh, Quba. She had a special house that she would be living in, and the Prophet would visit her once in a while. And he is the only lady that we know that the Prophet would say to her, Ya Ummah, O oh my mother. So he would call Umm Ayman, Ummah, O oh my mother. And that's the only lady that as an adult, obviously he must have called Amin at that, but other than that, the only person that we know that he would say, Ya Umma is Umm Ayman. And one time Umm Ayman visited the Prophet and he said, she is the only one left of my family. She's the only one left of my family. Everybody else is gone from those times. Only Umm Ayman is left. And we also know that Umm Ayman participated in Uhud and Khaybar, uh, as the women participated. How did the women participate? By taking care of the wounded and running with the water and whatnot. So Umm Ayman participated in the two battles that women were allowed to go in as helpers, and that is uh, Uhud and Khaybar. And uh, we can tell the love that the Prophet had for Umm Ayman through one uh, famous incident that I gave, we gave, I gave a khutbah uh, two years ago about humor in Islam, and I mentioned this incident there, um, and it shows the love that the Prophet had for Umm Ayman, that once the Prophet was going on an expedition, and so Umm Ayman volunteered and said, I want to go as well, but I need a camel. I need a camel. So the, the, the point was that whoever wanted to go, they would go and basically sign up. And once they signed up, then they would be supplied what is necessary to go. So if uh, they didn't have a camel, they will be sharing a camel and go together. So Umm Ayman said, I'm volunteering, sign my name up, and I need a camel. And so the Prophet said, I don't have a camel, I have waladun naqa. Waladun naqa. Now, in Arabic, waladun naqa linguistically means the child of a camel. And it is used to talk about a baby camel. It's meant to describe a baby camel. So there's no term for baby camel. There's no term for a child camel, a young camel, other than waladun naqa, right? So in English we say, a calf is a baby cow. There's a term for a calf, okay? A chicklet. So we have terms, a piglet. We have terms for baby animals. In Arabic, the term for a baby camel is waladun naqa. Clear? Now a baby camel, obviously, is not capable of going on a journey or carrying somebody, or being of any help. So, the Prophet said, I can give you a waladun naqa. And, Umm Ayman said, Ya Rasulullah, what's the purpose of a baby camel, waladun naqa? Neither can it benefit me, nor can I sit on it. So the Prophet said, no, I insist I will give you a waladun naqa. Right? Now, all of the jokes of the Prophet all of them, as far as I have done research, they involve these types of innocent puns. Because the Prophet never lied. He never uttered a falsehood. Whatever he said, it was the crystal truth. But how the person interpreted it is sometimes other than what the Prophet meant. So, 
Umm did not understand, I can't ride a baby camel. And the Prophet insisted, I'm going to give you a baby camel. Well, he didn't say baby camel. He said, waladun naqa, waladun naqa. Until finally, he then said, and Umm Ayman, what else is a camel except the child of another camel? Okay? In other words, I'm going to give you a full camel. But wasn't this camel also a child of a camel? Waladun naqa. So it's a linguistic play on words and all of the jokes of the process of linguistic plays on words uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, and the point being that, subhanAllah, the process only joked with very, very few close people that we know of. Very few close people that we know of. And Umm Ayman is one of them. So he's essentially teasing her. Essentially, and that's what you do with the loved ones, right? That's what you do with the ones that you have those soft feelings for. You just kind of tease them in a positive manner. And that is what he's doing with um, Umm Ayman. And Umm Ayman, uh, it is also reported that uh, she had some difficulty with um, uh, some Arabic words. Because again, Arabic is not her mother tongue. right? She is uh, Habashiya. She is an Abyssinian or whatever place she's from. And she had a... Uh, I mean, some have said it's a type of dyslexia or something, but, you know, some people, they have a problem with not just pronunciation, but when they see something, they'll say something slightly different. And Umm Ayman had that um, problem. And uh, a, n a number of times she would utter something that would uh, change the meaning. And the process would then joke with her to basically not say that anymore. So we have a number of reports like this, that uh, sometimes she would try to say, Assalamu alaikum. And it would come out, La salam alaykum. La salam alaykum. And of course, that means the exact opposite of Assalamu alaykum, right? La salam, no peace on you, right? So one day, Umm Ayman came and visited the Prophet and she said, La salam alaykum, because she's trying to say it. And the Prophet said, Ya Umm Ayman, just say salam, forget what's before and after. Just say salam, that's it. Don't try to say, Assalamu alaykum. Just say the, the um, salam. Uh, and on another occasion, uh, so again, she said something that uh, she was trying to make dua for the Muslims and it came out against them. So once again, again, accidentally, right? Uh, so instead of saying, Thabbatakumullah, she said, Sabakumullah. Like, yeah, literally, may God's curse be on you rather than may God make you firm. Literally the opposite. But again, because of the tongue things. And the Prophet smiled and said, Ya Umm Ayman, just be quiet, it is better for us. Like just again, these are jokes. There's nothing serious here. Just like the Prophet's love for Umm Ayman uh, and his teasing with her. Uh, and she had an issue with the uh, pronunciation. Now again, we don't have much knowledge about her. Uh, all that we know uh, is that uh, the Prophet passed away and Umm Ayman is still alive. And subhanAllah, think about that. Umm Ayman is still alive and the Prophet passes away. Very few of the Sahaba they go back to the very beginning and they remain till the very end. We mentioned one last halaqa, Hakim ibn Hizam, the one who purchased Zayd. Hakim ibn Hizam lived another 60 years after Islam. These are very few people. They go back to the beginning of Islam and they lived after Islam. Umm Ayman is one of those. You can count them on the fingers of one hand. And what we do know, the most authentic narration which is in the six books of hadith and multiple books of hadith of the six books that in the khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in the khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq one day Abu Bakr said to Umar radiallahu an so this is a year after the death of the Prophet year uh, less than a year or maybe a year at max one day Abu Bakr said to the uh, to Umar ibn al-Khattab halumma ya Umar come o Umar let us visit Umm Ayman like we used to visit her with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in other words, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, out of a love and a loyalty to the Prophet sallam, wants to do what the Prophet would do with the three of them, right? And this is what good friends and this is what offspring are supposed to do. Remember, one of the things a child is supposed to do is to do what? It's to maintain the friendship of the parents, right? Now, of course, the Prophet yani, even more so, Abu Bakr he should maintain those relationships. So he says to Umar, Come, let us go visit Umm Ayman as we used to visit her in the days of the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr and Umar, they stand and they walk to the place outside of, or before Quba, and they visit Umm Ayman. And she was obviously, you can imagine the three of them now, you know, and they don't have the Prophet And there's uh, uh, definitely that sadness and that grief comes. And Umm Ayman began to cry. Umm Ayman began to cry. 
And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, don't cry, O Ummi Ayman. Uh, you know, uh, the Prophet is now in Jannah in a better place. And Ummi Ayman said, I am not crying you know, just because I miss the Prophet Wasallam. I'm not crying because he's not here. I know that his place now is better than with us. But I am crying because with his death, Allah's wahi has co stopped coming to this earth. So the connection we had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Jibreel coming down, it is now stopped. And when she said this, Abu Bakr and Umar began sobbing as well. That it's not just the death of the Prophet but it's all gone now. Right? So all the memories came back of those days. And all of you can just imagine, you know, how traumatic it was. So Umm Ayman then she said it's not just the loss of the Prophet, it's the cutting off in Qita al Wahi that Allah's revelation has stopped coming. Jibreel is not coming, Quran is not being revealed. It's all a past phase now. And that has made me very sad. So they all three began crying. Rather than trying to console her, she made the both of them cry. And so all three of them are now uh, crying because of the, the sadness that they all felt with the loss of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the last tidbit we have about her. And she passed away in the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan, the very beginning of the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan. And she is buried in, of course, Baqi' al-Gharqad. So, uh, Umm Ayman's grave is in Baqi' al-Gharqad uh, to this day. And we now move on to the final of the family that we are interested in. Obviously, the family is larger than this. Zayd had other children. Umm Ayman had other children. We are interested in the three. Zayd, Baraka, Umm Ayman. And Usama. These are the three that is the immediate family, if you like, that we are interested in. And so from this blessed union, from uh, the uh, servant of the Prophet and his son, adopted son, Zayd, as we said, Tabanni, uh, and from Ummi Ayman, the, uh, the mother, again, when I say son and mother, I mean metaphorically, obviously not linguistically, uh, comes this blessed child, and that is Usama. Ibn Zayd. Now, Usama was born in Islam. So he's never seen Jahiliyyah. Because the marriage of Zayd and Umm Ayman took place after Islam, as we said. So Usama is born in Islam. And he has never seen the days of Jahiliyyah. And his status was well known. All of the Sahaba knew how much our Prophet wasallam loved Usama. Once, and this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. It is uh, one of the most famous hadith that all of you have heard. Once, a lady of great status was caught stealing uh, from the Quraysh. So she was from the nobility of Quraysh, from the elite of the Quraysh. And uh, she was caught, all the evidences was established, and the penalty was about to be enacted of stealing. So the Quraysh said, who can we go to to make shafa'a to the Prophet ﷺ to allow this lady to be scot-free? Who can we go to to find a way out to not have shafa'a? So one of them said, Who has that status other than Hibbu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I mean, there's only one person. Who else? In another version it says, Waman Who has the audacity to walk in and mention this other than Hibbu Rasulullah sallallahu and that is Usama ibn Zayd. So the nobility of Quraysh, they go to this young child, Usama ibn Zayd. Imagine, he must have been 15 years old. Can you imagine? The nobility and the elite, they go to Usama and they beg him, can you go to the Prophet sallallahu and then speak to him about the matter of this Qurashiyya, this high status lady, and just see if we can kind of let the... Uh, penalty go away. And so Usama is a young child. I mean, he's not, you know, he's not, he doesn't understand now what is going to happen or the, 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 the rebuke he's going to get. So he goes to the Prophet and he tries to make shafa'a for the Qurashiyya. And the Prophet became angry at him and he said, at Ya Usama, atashfa'u fi haddim min hududillah. O Usama, are you coming to me to avert a punishment, a had of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Fawallahi, law anna Fatima tabinta Muhammadin sarakat la qata'atu yadaha. Fawallahi, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had committed this crime, I would have cut off her hand. So the shafa'a was rejected. 
And of course, this shafa'a is haram once the qadi has given the verdict. Okay? Uh, before this point in time, we try our best to avert the hudud, as we said. Idra al hudud bi shubuhat. Any shubha, anything that's doubtful, we just get rid of the case. But once the case has been affirmed, once the judgment has been established, once the court has ruled, khalas, that is it. And nobody should now go around and try to find a way out. And this is one of the main points from we get, we get from this um, hadith. Uh, we also uh, learn, so Usama was born in, in Mecca. Uh, and uh, when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was, we know he was 18 years old, or maybe the end of 17 years old. So this means that he was born uh, seven years before the hijrah. Okay, he was born seven years before there. So we can roughly date pretty much the, the exact year that he was born because we know that he died. Uh, sorry, we know that the Prophet died and Usama was either late 17 or early 18 years old because as we're going to come to in a while, we know this for a fact. Uh, so therefore, uh, Usama was born literally in the house of the Prophet the house of Khadija. He was born in the house from a servant that was known to him since his birth, from uh, a, a, another servant that he had at that point in time adopted and considered to be uh, a son. So can you imagine the love showered on Usama, Hibbu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this love continued even after the migration to Medina. It is reported that once uh, Usama entered the house of the Prophet sallallahu as a child, he ran in and he slipped on the door or he tripped on the door and he fell down and it started to bleed. And so the Prophet picked up Usama himself and he cleaned the blood away and he wiped the blood and took care of Usama. And uh, he would carry Usama very often. And one time, uh, he, and he was a very physical father. You know, some fathers, they're very aloof. They don't touch. Uh, the Prophet was a very physical father. We know this from Hassan and Hussein, and we know it from Usama as well. He would carry the children. He would play with them. And so he is carrying uh, Usama. And Aisha narrates that one day he said, carrying Usama. So Usama's at this stage probably five years old, six years old. So uh, he says that, uh, if Usama were a jariya, were a little girl, I would have dressed her up and spent money on her. Now the point being, boys and girls uh, are treated differently. And girls you spoil, right? Alhamdulillah we can say this. It's okay to spoil little girls. Okay, we spend extra. And boys you're supposed to be a little bit like, you know, especially back then you're supposed to teach them, you know, harshness and whatnot. So the process of saying, if Usama were a girl, then I would have spent so much money and I would have done this and that, but it's a boy, so I cannot do what I would want to do. And this demonstrates as well, uh, you know, the natural d difference. And these days, all of this is being changed, as we know. But subhanAllah, the fitra says boys and girls are different. And we treat them uh, differently, and there's nothing wrong with um, that. And uh, Ibn Sa'ad reports that uh, it was common for the Prophet him to carry Hassan in one hand and Usama in the other. Okay, Hassan is the oldest grandson. He would carry Hassan in one and Usama in the other. And he would say, uh, Oh Allah, I love these two, so you love them as well. Allahumma inni Oh Allah, I love these two, so you love them as well. And Usama himself narrates, much later on obviously, that sometimes I would sit in one lap of the Prophet and Hassan would be in the other lap. So Usama and Hassan are... Uh, roughly same age, even though ha Usama is older. Usama is older, but still they're in the same age frame as that. And so Usama would be in one lap and Hassan would be in the um, other lap. And the Prophet would make dua for them and he would say, Oh Allah, have mercy on the both of them. Have mercy on the both of them. Now, Usama radiallahu ta'ala an, he went after his mother in terms of looks and complexion. And Zaid was essentially of the Banu Mudlish tribe, which is basically a lightish brown, okay? So Usama's skin color was exactly like that of his mother. So some of the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, the Jahi, well, it's Islam now, but still the non-Muslims yani the, the, you know, the non of the, the Quraysh, as is typical, and to irritate the Prophet they began to spread these bad rumors that Usama is not the son of Zaid, okay? Because remember, when Usama is born, technically, he is considered to be whom? 
the grandson, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, right? You understand this, like, I should have mentioned this actually explicitly, because Zayd was the, the son, so Usama then becomes essentially the grandson. Yani that is the considered notion, that he is the grandson. And again, this only changed officially five years into Medina, right? So Usama is like 12 years old. So like for literally a decade or longer, Usama is considered to be a grandson of the Prophet ﷺ by everybody. So when Usama is born, how can the Quraysh irritate the Prophet ﷺ by spreading a vicious and vile and evil slander? Astaghfirullah about Ummi Ayman. Okay? You understand what I'm talking about. That Zayd is not the father. You understand. Okay? Because the, 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 the skin and the whatnot is different. Zayd is this and Umm Ayman is that. And so Usama is not uh, the, the son of uh, Zayd. And a hadith in Sahih Muslim illustrates how much this hurt the process and also how much love he had for Usama and Zayd. This is an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim and other books of hadith. That one day in Medina, one day in Medina, uh, Aisha narrates that one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came into my house, rushed into my house, and I could see the happiness on his face. I could see something had happened. He's so happy. And he said, O oh Aisha, do you know that Al-Mujazzir Al-Mudliji came over and Usama and Zayd were lying in my room with a blanket and their heads were covered and only their feet were outside. And Al-Mujazzir said, هَذِهِ الْأَخْدَامِ بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بَعْضِ These feet are from one another. Now, this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Now, what is going on here? We have to pause and explain and clarify pre-Islamic culture and post-Islamic culture and whatnot. So, Al-Mujazzir, Al-Mudliji, was somebody who was one of the most famous people who practiced something called Al-Qiyafa. Al-Qiyafa. And Al-Qiyafa is to extract lineages based on similarities and facial features. This is a, is it a science? Is it an art? It's something the Arabs did. Okay? Before there was DNA tests. They had Qiyafa. And the Qiyafa was used by pre-Islamic Arabs to resolve disputes of paternity. Okay? So, as you know, they didn't have the laws of Islam. And it was possible for a woman to have married multiple men uh, in a short period of time. Or even, not even been married, let's say. There were women that were, again, known for these things like in, they are in our times. And if the woman had a child and she had multiple partners in a short time frame, one of the things the Arabs would do, they would call the Qa'if. Qiyafa, the Qa'if. Qa'if is the person, Qiyafa is the concept. They would call the Qa'if and they would say, okay, who does this baby belong to? And they would bring the men whom she said that she had been with and they would bring the baby. And that was his art that he would essentially extract who is the father based on the uh, based on the the characteristics of the uh, child and the the uh, an issue here footnote here based on this hadith some of the madhahib said that when there is a legitimate dispute of paternity and there are some really bizarre exceptional scenarios where this might happen in islam Bizarre, exceptional. Otherwise, the norm is that this is impossible to happen. But there are some beyond the scope of this class. We're not going to get into that. It's a very advanced fiqh stuff. But the point is that some of the madhahib, I think two, don't quote me on that. I think two of the four, said that in those cases, the qiyafa, the qa'if can be used based on this hadith. Because the Prophet is happy at what the qa'if has said. And they say the iqrar of the Prophet indicates that Qiyafa is a valid science. And, and, and. So they go and they extrapolate. For us, that's a fiqh issue beyond the scope of our class. We're not, we're not really interested in that. But what I would say, based on that, is that if Qiyafa was given a small tick or nod of approval, then 
even more so a priori ipso facto, we should use DNA and others, and this can be used as, as an Islamic evidence when the Sharia allows us to do so. And again, that's a separate issue beyond the scope of this class. Nonetheless, back to our hadith in Sahih Muslim. Beautiful hadith because it shows so many things. First and foremost, it shows Usama and Zayd are literally family. They are sleeping in the house of the Prophet I mean, who does that other than family? They're in the living room, wherever it is, and they're sleeping right there. So when we think of Zayd and Usama, unfortunately, we kind of think of them as strangers or outsiders, but they are insiders. And remember, for two decades, Zayd, and for a decade and something, Usama, were considered to be family. Remember this, right? So, emotionally, psychologically, they are family of the Prophet ﷺ. And they're sleeping there, father and son, must have been siesta, what not, you know, in the heat time, they would sleep in the afternoon, and they've covered themselves with a blanket, and their two feet are protruding. This also shows the poverty of the time, because the fact of the matter is, they did not have the luxury duvets that we all have. They did not have the, what is it, 5,000 count? Cotton? Huh? How much you have? You don't have that? Okay. The 4,000 one. The, the fancy ones. Uh, the what? You have the 200 one, Marshall. Okay, we're moving down. Okay. Uh, so, we, the fancy ones that are so massive, subhanAllah, in the house of the Prophet them, the father son have to share a blanket, and even that, it's not covering... It's not covering the whole body, right? And we know this from Hadith of Mus'ab as well, that his izar would not cover if they covered up, his feet would have they covered. So they're very, very poor. Of the things we benefit from this as well is the close relationship of Aisha and the Prophet Because what does the Prophet do? He rushes to Aisha. And that's exactly what you do. You rush to your loved ones. When something good happens, right? What do you do? You rush to your loved ones. You tell them, oh, guess what happened? So Aisha is saying, the Prophet came in upon me and I could see the happiness on his face, right? This also shows that what the munafiqun, well, I should say munafiqun, these are the pagans of Makkah. So, you know, the, this is not, this is the old times, but still, what they had said had hurt him, obviously. When somebody says something bad about your loved ones, it's going to hurt you, right? So when this Qa'if, and he is an Ajnabi, an outsider, he has no idea what the Quraysh have been saying. He has no idea who the two people are, because they're covered. He has no idea. He's simply visiting, and he sees the two feet. And he's an expert, right? So he says, these two feet, the one of them is the father of the other. He says this. So this made the Prophet so happy. That, do you know what he said? He said, that, meaning... That, and of course, taqfir, not that he's doubting, but you know, the point is again, that this is something that can be used against those evil people that are saying what they are uh, saying. So the point is that uh, because of his uh, complexion, you know, there were these, these, these false rumors. And unfortunately, we also have some of the munafiqun made snide remarks about him as well because of his complexion. And this is the way that it goes, that um, racism and ethnic differences, they are a part of our ummah. As our Prophet said, four things from jahiliyyah shall remain with my ummah. No matter how much we try to get rid of them, there will be tidbits what not remaining. And no, number one, he said, that being proud of your ancestry, which is racism. Okay, Number one out of the four things he said, al-fakhru bil ansab. So, uh, back to our story of Usama ibn Zayd. Uh, so, Usama, we know from about him as well that of his honors, now obviously Usama did not participate in most of the battles. Why? He's too young. He's too young to participate in Badr, in Uhud. He's simply too young. But what we do know is that he had a number of honors that are very, very clearly demonstrative of how close uh, the process is to Usama. And of them is that the process chose Usama to be uh, the one who's riding on his camel in two of the most important instances in the history of Islam. Now, in those days, nobody had the luxury of riding on one camel by himself. It just didn't happen. Even if you were rich enough to own your camel, you had to share with people who didn't own a camel. It was just the, the concept of having your own mount did not happen. Sometimes even three people would be to a camel. And this is common, we read in the seerah. Uh, and sometimes two would be on the camel and one would walk and then they would alternate. 
but nobody ever had a camel to himself. Everybody had to have a, a partner, sharing partner. And this is called radif. 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 And the radif means the riding companion. So the Prophet ﷺ chose Usama on two extremely important occasions to be his radif. The first of them, perhaps the highlight of the entire seerah in terms of in terms of izza and victory, and that is the conquest of Makkah. Who is the radif of the Prophet? Usama ibn Zayd. Usama is the one riding on the camel when the Prophet enters Makkah as the conqueror. And that's when he lowers his head, the Prophet, he lowers his head until it is touching the back or almost touching the back of the camel. So the fact that it is none other than Usama. Again, this demonstrates how close he is to the Prophet ﷺ. And the second time that we have at least 15 ahadith narrated by Usama on this occasion. At least 15 ahadith that Usama narrated on this one occasion. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ put him on his camel during the last fil pilgrimage, Hajj. Uh, now, he wasn't the only one. At times, Jabir was writing. At times, Ibn Abbas, at times Al-Fadl Ibn Abbas, and at times Usama. Usama was, and one of the most important segments of the Hajj was Usama was the Radif, the, the one on the camel, from uh, Arafat to Muzdalifa, and then to Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ rode with Usama from Arafat to Muzdalifa. And in fact, the riwayat mention that uh, Usama, for some reason we don't know why, was delayed in Arafat. However long, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, like however long he was delayed. So because he was delayed, the process was delayed. Because the process was delayed, everybody's delayed. So Usama held up the entire hujjaj for whatever reason. And then remember I said some of the munafiqun made snide remarks. This is when we have one of those remarks that when it turned out that this is why they are delayed, so some of the munafiqun made some crude remarks that so and so, and they described some things about him. This is the one that delayed us and whatnot. And this demonstrates again this issue of looking down at others because of your uh, ethnicity or tribe. Uh, so uh, Usama was one of the, as we said, the chosen ones to ride with the camel on the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Usama was one of the only two people who entered the Kaaba with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Only two people entered with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of them was Bilal and the other was Usama. Okay, so Usama and Bilal entered with the Prophet ﷺ. and people like Abdullah ibn Umar and others are outside, they don't know. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ walked out, that's when Abdullah ibn Umar rushed in and he said to Usama, Where did the Prophet say? Where did the Prophet ﷺ pray? So Usama told him he prayed in between the two pillars, and so Ibn Umar prayed over there. So the honor given to Usama to be with that elite, elite entourage to enter the Kaaba with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is given to um, Usama. Uh, we ha also have a hadith in Tirmidhi and others that again, we have to extract from these a hadith benefits about the life of, of Usama and whatnot. So we also have uh, a hadith where um, somebody gifted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a very, very fine fabric to use as a uh, rida. The, the cloak and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in turn gifted it to Usama and the next day he asked Usama where is the rida that I gave you because they were very poor and if you have been given, given this gift you're going to wear it the next time you see you like they don't have you know I mean subhanAllah we have what 50 shirts and 40 pants and what they don't have that so the fact that the Prophet is giving him a rida, he expects it to be used right then and there. Like, okay, you're going to see you next time. So next time, where is it? Right? So Usama, being the loving husband that he was, he said, I have gifted it to my wife, mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay? So notice, the Prophet is gifted it. He gives it to Usama. Then Usama gives it to his wife. Uh, why is this in the books of hadith or the books of fiqh, sorry? Uh, no, the books of hadith, sorry. And then in the books of fiqh, because the Prophet then said to uh, to Usama that 
okay, make sure that your wife wears something underneath before she puts that on because I fear that its fabric is too thin. And of course, this is common sense. We know this, but this hadith proves it. That uh, when uh, a lady dresses in the proper hijab and she walks outside, then the hijab not only must be loose, it must also be non-transparent. Okay, so from this we derive the fiqhi benefit that we all know. That's why this hadith is found in the books of fiqh. That a woman should not wear uh, clothing that is extremely see-through or translucent, translucent uh, or tight or whatnot. So the, because the Prophet said to Usama that make sure you tell her that she is wearing something underneath, then she uses this on top of that. On top of that. So um, again, the point though is who did the Prophet choose to give the gift to? It was none other than um, Usama. And one of the uh, incidents as well that is mentioned in the books of Hadith uh, demonstrates no matter how beloved somebody is when they make a mistake, the Prophet will correct them. Okay? That happened in the Shafa Hadith, and there's a Hadith that is even more awkward or even more clear cut, if you like rebuke to Usama from the Prophet ﷺ because Usama made a mistake. And when you make a mistake of this nature, you need to be corrected. And this hadith is mutafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim and it is narrated so many times. I mean, this is one of those very deep narrations that the scholars use to derive so many points um, in chapters of fiqh. And that is that once the Prophet ﷺ sent Usama on a small expedition and he was put in charge. So this is in the ninth year of the Hijrah. This is in the ninth year of the Hijrah and he's put in charge and he's commanded to attack such and such a tribe that had done whatever they had done. So the point is, your job is to basically attack that tribe. So a small group is sent, Usama is placed as a leader. So Usama was always chosen as a leader, even as a young teenager. And uh, the narration goes that we surprised them, we caught them, they had no idea we were on their hit tail, and we surprised attack them. And we began, you know, battling them, and me and an Ansari cornered one of them. Me and an Ansari, Ansari and I recorded one of them, and I managed to overpower him. And he fell back. So he's now on the ground. The both of us raised our swords. Then the mushrik cried out, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. This is on the battlefield. And the guy sees the two swords. And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. So Usama says, so the Ansari put his sword down. As for me, keep on going. The news reached the Prophet ﷺ that the guy had said the kalima, and I still went ahead and finished him off. So he called me, and he said, Ya Usama, O Usama, kayfa qataltahu? How could you have killed him? When he said, La ilaha illallah. Usama said, Ya Rasulallah. He only said it to save himself. Then that powerful phrase that has become now common in the Arabic language. is It is now an expression that is used by the Arabs and by Muslims across the globe. Fahalla shaqaqta ala qalbihi. Or afala shaqaqta ala qalbihi. Why didn't you open up his chest then if you're that certain? Like this is anger. Did you see why he said the kalima? Do you know the reason why he said the kalima? Do you know what was in his heart? And he said to Usama, what are you going to do with la ilaha illallah on judgment day? And he continued to repeat Mada taf'al? What are you going to do with La ilaha illallah on Judgment Day? And Usama says, Ma zala yuraddidu. He kept on repeating this until I wished that I had only accepted Islam that morning. Now, what does this mean? I had accepted Islam that morning. This is one interpretation that I wish that my sin had been forgiven. Another interpretation that I wouldn't have known any better. I'm a brand new Muslim. Meaning, I should have known better. I've been a Muslim and living in the house of the Prophet since I was born. And I don't have an excuse. So I wish that I had been a brand new Muslim so that at least I could say, well, I didn't know any better. Right? 
So basically, Usama is like feeling so guilty, but uh, and it is a mistake. And from this, we derive the mistake. I and mean, we all now, of course, this is a basic point of fiqh. Now we all know this that the kalima, even on the battlefield. I mean, imagine this: even at this point in time, when the guy has fought and he tried to kill you, you overpowered him, and at that point, he says, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah," khalas. That gives him an, a man or gives him security, and at least he is taken. He can still be taken prisoner, whatever, but he has now a type of safety. This is now all the madahib uh, say this. So uh, the point is that no matter how beloved you are, if you make a mistake, you need to be corrected. And we see this from the Prophet and Usama multiple times, Shifa hadith and the hadith, this one over here as well. When the Prophet fell ill in the 11th year of the Hijrah, as we know, he, would, he was sending out what was to become the very final expedition uh, that was against the Ghassanids up north. And uh, he appointed Usama ibn Zayd, who was at this time either late 17 or early 18 years old. And in this army were senior Sahaba, including Abu Bakr and Umar. This is amazing, truly amazing. You have a group Amongst them are Abu Bakr and Umar. And in age, and in experience, and in wisdom, there is no question they are who they are. And yet, Usama is placed in charge of them. Now, some ulama have said, one of the reasons that Usama has been placed, and this is a very valid point, is that it is as if he is now going also to revenge, to avenge the death of his father. Because it's the same people up there. Okay, and that's a valid point. Nonetheless, even if that is a point, you still have to have the maturity and the wisdom and the bravery, and he had all of these things. Okay, so Usama is placed as the uh, chieftain or the commander of that, and people began to mumble. How could he have placed this person who has no experience? How could he have placed a young child? And there are Abu Bakr and Umar, and he has no credentials like they do. And our Prophet Sallallahu He's sick, he's lying on his deathbed. They don't know it's his deathbed, but he's lying on his deathbed, and these rumors reach him back. And so, and this hadith is in the Sahihain and it's in others, uh, that one of the last times the Prophet exited his house and stood on the mimbar. This is literally the second to last, or maybe the third to last time they see him, is to defend Usama ibn Zayd. And he managed to pour water, or they poured water on him. He get, gathered his strength, and he was brought out, and he stood on the, uh, on the pulpit, and he gave a, an advice and a sermon in a mo'idah, and he mentioned the issue of Usama in that. And he said, if you are grumbling about Usama, then wallahi, you also grumbled about his father, Zayd. And his father was of the most beloved people to me, and his son is of the most beloved people to me. This is of the last phrases our Prophet ﷺ uttered in public. The defense of Zayd and his son, uh, Usama. And uh, we know from the many, many ahadith that on his deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ would you know, fall into a faint or whatever, you know, unconscious. Then he would wake up and he would say, have you sent the Jaish Usama? Have you sent the Jaish of Usama? So it's on his mind, he wants Usama to go until finally, because he keeps on insisting, even though they didn't want Usama to go, but what are you going to do? So the, the, the message was given, okay, go ahead and leave the city. And subhanAllah, Usama left the city and Usama's wife, uh, Fatima bint Qais, uh, the, the sister of Thabit ibn Qais, the famous Sahabi, Usama's wife, Fatima bint Qais, sent a messenger that when they had only half a day outside the city, she sent a messenger, stop, do not proceed. The process and situation has worsened even more. And so Usama rushed back. The army was outside. Usama rushed back and he managed to see the Prophet ﷺ on his deathbed. Literally a few hours or the day before again, we don't know exactly when. And the Prophet ﷺ was too weak to speak, but he saw Usama, he recognized Usama, and he raised his hands up to Allah and he pointed to Usama. 
indicating that Allah is with you and I'm making dua for you. So raising his hand up to Allah and pointing to Islam. He could not say anything at this point in time. And of course, our Prophet passed away either that day or the next day. And then, then the whole issue of Usama's army came up and what to do. Usama went, so Abu Bakr obviously has to now remain behind. Abu Bakr tells Umar to remain behind. Uh, Usama then says to Abu Bakr, I cannot leave you. I'm going to cancel the whole expedition. We're going to come back. We're going to stay in Medina. We're going to protect you. I fear for the Arabs leaving the, the and becoming murtad and whatnot. We're going to stay here. And Umar said, yes, stay here. And all the senior Sahaba said, yes, stay here. But what did Abu Bakr say? How can I cancel the last order of the Prophet Wasallam? I can't do that. How can I abrogate what he commanded to do? And eventually a compromise was reached. What was the compromise? That Usama's force would, the, 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 the mission would be downgraded and the people would be downgraded, but still there would be a mission. So the spirit of sending Usama out would still happen. They would meet people, but it's not going to be the big uh, expedition that the Prophet wasallam wanted. And in fact, Usama and his forces did meet a Roman battalion and they were victorious. Small skirmish, it was a minor thing in the grand scale of things, but it was a skirmish nonetheless and they were victorious and they came back victorious. And it is reported in the books of history that the Caesar of Rome, Heraclius, received the news of the death of the Prophet and of the attack of Usama at the same time by the same person. In other words, the news of the death and the news of the attack was simultaneous for the Caesar. The same guy. And he said, what type of people are these? That their prophet has just died and they're still attacking our lands. And subhanAllah, that was perhaps one of the main wisdoms. Right? Like how? He cannot understand. Who are these people? That their prophet has just died and they're still attacking our lands. And... Uh, Usama, uh, of course, lived a long life. We're going to finish off, inshallah, a bit. We'll have to delay Isha for a few minutes because we don't have time to come back to Usama. Just finish it off now. That in the Khilaf of Umar bin Khattab, whenever Usama uh, would enter uh, to uh, visit Umar and the people would be sitting there, Umar ibn Khattab would say, Assalamu alayka ya Amir. This is Umar. He is Amir al Mu'minin. Assalamu alayka ya Amir. So somebody said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, why do you call him Amir? You are the Amir. So he said, How can I not call him Amir when, when the Prophet died? He was the Amir. Imagine, you understand how? You understand how? The battle. Yeah, he was the head of the army. He was the Amir. So when the Prophet died, he was the Amir of the army, not of the Muslims. He was the Amir. So for as long as Umar was alive, he would say, Ya Amir. And Amir also means leader and prince and whatnot. So he's calling Usama Amir every time he met him. And Umar ibn Khattab gave Usama, you know the pay scale? He gave Usama grade A, right? Level whatever, highest level. Uh, 4,000 dinars they would get. That is what the elite, the people of Badr would get. And Usama was not a Badri. Usama was not a Badri. He would get what the people of Badr got. One day, somebody teased Abdullah ibn Umar. We did ibn Umar three weeks ago. One day, somebody teased Abdullah ibn Umar and said to Abdullah ibn Umar that your father gives a man who is younger than you, more than you. Even though you are senior to him in rank and senior in ghazawat and senior in hijrah. You've done more and your own father gives somebody younger with a smaller CV, he gives them more than you. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, who? So the man said, Usama ibn Zayd. So Abdullah ibn Umar went to his father, Umar ibn Khattab, and he said, Ya Abata, why do you give Usama more than me, even though he has less ghazwas than me, and his hijrah is after mine, and, and so he listed all that he had. So Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Bunay, O my son, he was more beloved to the Prophet than you, and his father was more beloved to the Prophet than your father. If that is not Adil, 
than what is. He gives Usama more than he gives his own son and himself. Because he was more beloved than you were. And his father is more beloved than meaning himself. So why should I not give him more than you? And Usama remained very low-key throughout the Khulafa al-Rashidun. He never took any major uh, political position. And he lived with his mother, uh, Umm Ayman Baraka, for as long as his mother was alive. And he was very loving and caring towards Umm Ayman. And a very beautiful report is reported um, in Ibn Sa'd in his Tabaqat that at one point in time, during the time of Umar, there was a drought and whatnot. And so the prices of date palms skyrocketed. Inflation. And they were selling live date palms, agricultural. They were selling for 1,000 coins each date palm. Fresh date palm, 1,000 coins. One day they saw Usama chopping his date tree down and taking the inner sap, you know, uh, what is going to be the, the term? You know, like the cane juice. You know, what do you call that? You know, right? There's that sap, you know, that thing inside of it. The, the date palm also has something similar to that. And it's just sweet and nice. At one season, at one season, you get something not as sweet as the sugar cane. Not as sweet as that, but it's something similar to that. Right? So he was cutting it down to get that one thing. So the people said to him, Oh, Usama, what are you doing? This tree is worth 1,000 dinars. I mean, you're cutting it down. You can sell it and buy whatever you want. Like it's a fortune. Why would you be cutting it? And he said, my mother was craving that sap. Right? My mother was craving that juice or whatever. And so I'm cutting it down for her. They said, you could have sold it and gotten anything for her. Like, why that one thing? Buy something else. You have a thousand dinars. And he said that whatever my mother asks for, if I have the qudra to do it, I will do it. Like, if she wants it, khalas, it's going to be hers. Doesn't matter what the cost is. So this is how Usama was with his mother and what a beloved mother and uh, person that was. Uh, his mother, of course, passed away in the time of, of Uthman radiallahu anh. He lived after this a very simple life, as we said, away from politics. And he would take care of his fields. He had some fields outside of Medina. And he would avoid any controversy. Uh, it is reported in Muslim Imam Ahmed that once when he was much older, his servant said to him that, why do you fast every Monday and Thursday, especially when you're traveling to your fields and you're coming back? You're an old man. You're a musafir. Why do you have to fast? And so he said, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu fast on Mondays and Thursdays and he told me that on Mondays and Thursdays our actions are presented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The famous thing that we all know, so Usama would fast Mondays and Thursdays. Then he was alive when the controversies began between the Sahaba and Ali radiallahu an sent him a message that please join me in the battles that are going to take place. He needed Usama for support, moral support. And a servant came and gave the message. He sent the message back with the servant as follows. That, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you were trapped in a lion's den, in the cave of a lion, I would have loved to enter it with you. But this matter, I cannot agree to it. Wassalamu alaikum. Meaning, if I had to defend you, or if there's a problem or something, count me in. But now you're talking about fighting between Muslims. I cannot get involved. And so he refused to get involved completely in the civil war. And he lived right outside of Medina, probably to avoid the controversies and whatnot, in small villages until he passed away in the year 54 uh, after the Hijrah, in the beginning of the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu an. So he lived throughout all of this time, but nothing is narrated about him because he remained away from politics. He just kept to himself, worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lived a simple life, and in fact he passed away outside of Medina in this village of Jurf, and his body was then carried back to Medina. Janazah was prayed to him over in Medina, and he was buried in Baqir al-Gharqad where his uh, grave is to this day. And as we said, Usama ibn Zayd, uh, what we know about him was that he was 
extremely dark skinned and he had a flat nose as well. Uh, we know this again from the reports that uh, were said against him. Uh, towards the end of his life as well, uh, he gained some weight. So he actually had a bit of a belly. We know this because his izar would fall lower beneath the belly. Because you know in those days, the izar would be, ta- would be tied at the belly. Right? But obviously, if you have a belly, like how do I wear my pants? Huh? How do all of us, except the very fit amongst us, wear our pants? It goes slightly under the belly, correct? Right? That is where the izar would fall for, for Usama. And so we know this from that. We know as well that he had a bit of a belly towards the end of his life. Uh, Usama married uh, at least two, if not more, women uh, in his lifetime, and he had a number of uh, children. Uh, his most uh, famous wife, uh, and with this we conclude, was Fatima bint Qais. Uh, her claim to fame uh, is not just because she is the sister of Thabit bint bin Qais, who was a famous Sahabi, but because the Prophet himself told Fatima to marry Usama. And this was his first wife, Fatima bint Qais. Fatima came to the Prophet in Hadith in Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. Uh, Sahih Muslim for sure, maybe Sahih Bukhari. Uh, and Fatima said, Ya Rasulullah, I've gotten two proposals. Two proposals. One from Muawiyah, the Muawiyah, the famous Muawiyah. And one from some Sahabi by the name of Abu Jaham. Right? Which one should I choose? So the Prophet said, Amma Muawiyah, fasa'lukun la malalah. As for Muawiyah, he is penniless. He doesn't have anything. How are you going to marry him? Pause here, footnote. Muawiyah would eventually become one of the richest Arabs and the Khalifa and, and, and. But all of this is Allah's qadr, up and down finances go. And you do not know the future. And looking at a person's finances is common sense. Nothing un-Islamic about that. So Muawiyah at the time was jobless and penniless. And the Prophet said to uh, Fatima, how can you marry Muawiyah? How is he going to support you? Sa'luk, penniless. La malala. Wa amma Abu Jaham. And as for Abu Jaham, he never allows his stick to even reach the floor. It's always at his arm's length. Most likely the meaning here is that he is physically abusive. Most likely. Another interpretation is that he's always traveling. But this is the weaker interpretation because being a traveler in and of itself is not a problem. So here we have a hadith where the Prophet is saying that he's bad-mannered about his wife. He's abusive. Don't marry him. So we have here a hadith that mentions that if you are penniless, then you don't have to choose this person. And also if you're a bad akhlaq, you're abusive, you don't have to choose this person. So, where am I heading with all this? With this we conclude. The Prophet said, don't choose him, don't choose him. Choose Usama ibn Zaid. So, Fatima bint Qais chose Usama and they lived and they had many children together and they had a, uh, a long marriage together and because she obeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with that we conclude the story of Zaid and Baraka slash Umm uh, Ayman and Osama ibn Zayd. And inshallah, with that, we conclude our series on uh, the Sahaba for now.